love that Steve has described himself as the ultimate Twiggins fanboy, and I think the three of us all fit into that category, and I'm going to have uh, a lot of fun listening to what the two of them have to say, too, as we banter back and forth about stuff. But before we do that, I wanted to give you a little amuse, uh, just 10 minutes worth of something kind of obscure, which is we're familiar with Dwiggins spines. Everybody sees those and they're talked about. But he was especially interested in front board designs also, decorations. And I wanted to just scoot through. This is not comprehensive. I just wanted to give you a few minutes of fun looking at uh, some of the things that that he uh, produced, mostly for Knopf. So I'm just gonna, gonna race through these if I can find my cursor and get rid of this cable Wi-Fi thing. Um, where is it? There we go. Okay. Okay. So he um, he started out in Boston wanting to do whole books. He moved there in 1904. Wanted to do whole books, couldn't. He did covers, um, spine labels, title page artwork, that kind of stuff. But it wasn't until many years later that he was able to do complete books. But uh, I love love this lettering and illustration. Here's a uh, it's about three inches in diameter, gold foil. This, I got, uh, this is not my picture, it's, it's pretty fuzzy, but he did something for the Friday Night Club that was privately printed in uh, Boston, and I love this little device. So this is on the front cover of that book. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of this kind of thing for Harvard University Press. Here's a printed label for the first book that he did completely in 1917. And uh, our biography of Dwiggan shows his early sketch next to this printed label. So he's beginning to work his way into decoration. Guy de Mer was uh, the French equivalent of uh, Eddie Rickenbacker. And, um, he died when he was in his 20s, but he had, I don't know, 60, um, shot down 60 planes. So he was this, this sort of the Babe Ruth of aviation in, in World War One, And so this is a, a cover that uh, Dwayne said for Carl Rollins when Rollins was at Yale. This is not a published book, but it is so dripping with coolosity I wanted to put it in the <laughs> slides anyway. This is for Strathmore. Here is his, uh, what we might call his craft period. He did several things for Yale on craft paper. Given how much lettering he did, I think it's curious. Look at the sort of very Bembo-ish capital R in the word ran, and how much space there is between the R and the A. I, I kind of marvel at his, what was it that you said, Steve? Um, not organized chaos. Something abandoned. Yeah. There's a way that Dwiggins doesn't care at, about <laughs> everything being refined and balanced and perfect. And I love that about it. This is a, a piece that he did for S.D. Warren, his major client in the teens and 20s. This uh, early 1920s for Harvard University Press. Rogers did the interior for this, but Dwiggins did this cover and also the jacket. A few years later, he did a book for Rudge called 22 Printer's Marks. And this, even though he hadn't started working for Lyotype yet, I just feel these echoes of the little Yale key marks on the mats as they're about to go up and be redistributed in this device. Um, cover for an edition of The Complete Angler, made for Charles Goodspeed in Boston in the 1920s. He referred to these as Dutch tiles with a Persian twist. Uh, 
Crosby Gage was a Broadway producer who decided to dabble in publishing. He got in and back out just before the crash, so he didn't crash and burn as hard as he might have, but he did, for two or three years, he did a number of titles, not just with Wiggins, but with other designers. This one I, I just adore. And when you look at the difference in these three books, this is a James Cabell uh, poetry book, and then here's Lytton Strachey's uh, Elizabeth and Essex. So these were all produced within a year of each other. Now we get into these more tight in on the design, maybe three inches square things for the, uh, for the front boards. This is very late 20s and early 30s, so he's really starting to play with his stencil designs. This is a uh, something called the Roosevelt Omnibus. After Roosevelt was elected, this is this huge, uh, large format book that talks about Roosevelt's life and, and uh, private life and so on, his, his history and politics. Uh, Sigurd Unset, uh, Stages on the Road. Uh, Alfred and Blanche Knopf were extremely adept at signing all of these European writers, Thomas Mann and, and Unset and so on. So this is from one of her many books that they published. Hausmann. There are two books about Henri IV, the French king, Henry of Navarre, and uh, this device is on uh, the fronts of both of those. This is a, a chronicle of the four founders of the Central Pacific Railroad, Leland Stanford, C.P. Huntington, Charles Crocker, and Mark Hopkins. And again, it's a really cool book, too. Uh, I haven't read every book in my collection, but I actually, over the 40-some years that I've been collecting Dwiggins, I've read a lot of these books, and they're all wonderful. Stephen Crane, he likes to put the author's initials into the design whenever he can. This is a collection of 10 essays on Napoleon and what he accomplished, what his interactions with people were, were like. Uh, here you have a, a newspaper reporter and a novelist who both tell a story. They're good friends and they, they change around the facts and the stories and go back and forth with it. So here, that's stamped with clear foil on the front. And again, you've got the AG initials of the author. Here's a rare instance of his using tonal blends rather than flat line color. This is another great book, these weird collection of characters of rural Sweden in an old mansion. James Kane's Serenade, and in 1930 he came up with a deco alphabet for the book American Alphabets that's on the front cover, and then nine years later he used it here. The jacket is often shown for Serenade, but rarely does one see this uh, stamped cover. This is uh, one of my most favorite things he did, silver foil on these very natural blue and, and white canvas cloth, and then black foil stamped also. Uh, Nathan was famously difficult as an author, but he made piles of money for Knopf. And in fact, Knopf said, Nathan makes so much money we can afford to print other books that will never break even, but deserve to be published, which I thought was really great. So he thanked Dwiggins for his patience working with, with Nathan, who apparently was famously difficult. And you'll see a discussion in the book uh, between Knopf and Dwiggins about what should be foil stamped, because those books are expensive to produce? Which one should be done in ink? He was an early uh, booster of paperbacks before paperbacks existed, and was ahead of his time in that way, wanting to deliver books to the proletarian readers for, for less money. Here's another uh, in the stable of authors who had lots of decorated covers, uh, similar in design from one title to the next, Conrad Richter. Here's an edition of Faust, and I'll blow this up so that you can see the 
front cover a little better. Heritage, which was Limited Editions Club's way of capitalizing on their investment in the artwork, they would reissue the LEC books as heritage titles. And so this is on the left, a combined edition, and then on the right are the two spines of um, Through the Looking Glass and Alice's Adventures. And then on the right is the front cover decoration for the combined edition. A uh, series title for yet another uh, book project for George Macy, the same one who did LEC and Heritage called the Reader's Club. And he did several press marks, as you can see there on the front cover is one of them. This is a, a part Navajo, part white youth who falls in love with a Mormon woman uh, out west. Classic newspaper, black letter. Another uh, blind stamped cover. And this is the front board decoration for Dwiggins' own marionette play, uh, Millennium One, which is about a, a band of insurgent humans who are fighting against machines that have taken over the world. <laughs> this is about Richmond during the Civil War. It's called The Beleaguered City. A book called Romping Through Mathematics for the Lay Reader. And again, RWA, Raymond W. Anderson is the author, and you can see those initials there. Uh, one of his uh, close friends who was in the marionette troupe, Elizabeth Coatsworth, who was a Newbery winning uh, children's book writer, did a series of very ghoulish poems called The Creaking Stair. And this is the front door decoration for that, mm -hmm. stamped in silver. And this was printed in Tippecanoe, which was never released by Linotype, but they had took it far enough along. So things like Tippecanoe and Stuyvesant were able, they were able to print at least one book in them, and so hers got printed in, in Tippecanoe, which is his riff on Bodoni. This is uh, the Shirley letters written from the mines in California in the Gold Rush period. These are essays on what's happening with modern civilization after, right after World War II. What have we looked at in the way that Russia evolved, the way that capitalism evolved, and so on. Bernard Shaw, here's his kind of chinoiserie, half 2D, half 3D stuff. Letters written to Gertrude Stein. This is what we made an animation of for the Kickstarter campaign for the book. And here's Gordon, who was the general at Khartoum. And this is stamped on black cloth in matte copper and very bright silver foil. Done just a couple of years before Dwiggins died. And then uh, this is a book about the national parks. And in 1956, the year that he died, I can't think of a more joyful and ebullient person who, in the face of brittle diabetes and various other challenges, never had a bitter word to say to anybody. And one of the last books that he did was called The Spirit of Tragedy. And this is the uh, artwork for that. And that's the end of the pictures. Most of the things you've shown me here, and many of the things in the book, even though I did an exhibition that had over 100 pieces in it, I've never seen much of this before. How did you get involved with Dwiggins? How did you do the research on Dwiggins? Where did you get the material? And how old were you? When I was 22, I moved to Boston with my great college buddy, Jeff, who's in the back of the room. And part of the story about all of this, the production of this book, is how many relationships go back 30 and 40 years. The people who printed the book I've worked with since 1980, the people who bound it. 
Rob and I have known each other since the 1970s. So Jeff and I would go into the BPL looking often for graphic arts titles that had been uh, lifted and not returned by patrons, which was too bad. And one day he met Dorothy, who was installing the three rooms in the special collections that had the Dwiggins marionettes and his work table and so forth. So the next day I went back with him to meet her, and that began a whole series for many years of visits to Dwiggins Studio in Hingham, where she was making her home. And uh, we put a potluck lunch together. There was one famous time I remember I was staying at Rob's house, and he slept through the alarm. And I was supposed to make a potato quiche, which was one of the things I would take. Dorothy would make a salad. And um, we got up an hour and a half later. We'd been staying up late listening to jazz the night before. And I realized, oh, if I'm going to get to Dorothy's, I just have to leave now with no potato quiche. And Dorothy flipped out that, because she was very systematic and clear about what she wanted. She saved Dwiggins. You guys, too. I think that. That show in the 1980s was a kind of lifeline that kept, during this eclipsing of his stuff, that kind of kept his name going. But anyway, um, I spent a lot of happy times there at the studio and began in 1980 giving talks about him. Book builders in Boston asked me to give a talk about Dwiggins because they have an award every year and they wanted to know more about him and why why the award is in his name. So I stood up there with my knees knocking together and gave this talk, and that began what has been all these years since of lecturing about him and sharing my love of him as a, a whole person, not just a designer of types or a maker of marionettes. And I was complaining to my friend Rocky Steinhauer in 2003 that there, here are all these books on Paul Rand, how come there aren't as many books on Wiggins? And Paul Shaw's been working on him for years. Well, why isn't Dwiggins up there in lights? And he said, well, you love him, you should do it. And I thought, well, I'm not a biographer. I don't know how to do this. So I went into the BPL. I just started doing this kind of systematic research. I thought, how am I going to present this? And I decided he is so, he has so many plates in the air simultaneously and feeds off of what he learns from one pursuit that might influence another one. I think I want to do it, even though it's people say, oh, the cradle to grave biography is old fashioned, and so on. That's how I wanted to do it. And so the book is broken up into chapters based on workspaces. Some chapters are pretty skinny because he was only there two years. Other ones are bigger because he was there for 20 years. And so I organized it around that and just started right, and eventually it began to take form. I had a lot of help from Rob, from my old friend Doris. This is another example. She's a copy editor and proofreader. I've been working with her since 2003 or 2004, and we've done a lot of books together. So she was instrumental in cleaning up my act in terms of what I was saying. She did a good job. I haven't found any time. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so let me ask Rob. I, I, Rob, you started as a publisher. You were doing children's books that were really quite wonderful a long, long time ago. Uh, now you're running uh, the archive. Why did you select this book to be your first archive publication? And what did you throw into it to make it something you're happy and proud of? Um, it, it seemed like kind of an obvious first book. We actually have a number of books coming along. There's a, there's a pipeline. This is not our only book by any means. It's just our first. And we kind of wanted to make a splash. The project kept getting more and more complex. I mean, when, when Bruce and I first talked about it, he had talked to some trade publishers, and they were interested, but for the most part, they seemed to be kind of pressing for lower costs. So they wanted fewer pages, smaller illustrations, cut the text. And I said, no, it's just that, like, that's not the way to do this. Let's see if we can do um, something that, that really does justice to Wiggins. And um, so we started working together on it. And it seems like a natural first, because first of all, 
both Bruce and I have collected with us for 40 years. Um, so the archive has a pretty substantial collection of ribbons, and that meant that we could control the photography of that stuff. Um, and we also, in the end, did, I think there's only two pictures in the book or something that are, that are not our photographs. <coughs> Which is which is pretty unusual and helps to explain the, the kind of repro the standard of repro model because we were able to do um, our own photography. Describe more of that standard. We were looking through a loop at a very small picture and you could actually read the body text. Right, right. There's a there's a a, a shrunken book spread. It's about this big, and you know the functional size of the type is like one and a half point or something. You can actually read it with the loop. Um, so there are two things that go into this repro quality. One is is the photography. The difference there is that it's a very high resolution um, digital camera, but it's also done with breaking light, which is different from standard copy work is done with butterfly lighting, which is like this. And it intentionally blows out surface texture for the most part. Uh, in the old days, it had to go. You couldn't print it reliably. And so, um, you know, if you think back, graphic design monographs and, and it's kind of carried forward. A lot of people are still doing it the same way where they'll do things like line conversions and then drop tints for the background and square it up and it's clean and that's great. But it doesn't give you that sort of photorealistic sense of the, the um, physical reality of the thing. Breaking light captures texture. But in order to, to print that detail, the second thing is it's printed with stochastic screening which is a tech that's been around for about 20 years and um, varying degrees of popularity. It, it, it had a lot of technical issues early on and uh, was hard to hold consistently on the presses at the time, but the presses have advanced so much uh, with automatic density control and, and uh, drying it over, UV drying it over the tower that you can actually print stochastic now reliably. The difference, con conventional screening represents density with a grid of dots where the dots vary in size. And when you look at, you know, you look at the naked eye, depending on the resolution of the screen, you can see those dots or you see a rosette, uh, which is basically a pattern, a half uh, pattern of the conventional screen. Stochastic is done with uniformly sized dots um, that are very, very tight and they're measured in microns. And uh, density is, is represented by clustering. And so it's a kind of a more natural, it feels more like um, uh, continuous tone or, I mean, even photography isn't actually continuous tone. Silver gelatin uh, media have grain, but it's very, very fine. And so it's a, it's a proxy for continuous tone. In short, it feels great. It looks great. <laughs> <laughs> those shadows drive me crazy. In a good way. Yeah. Uh, let, let's talk a bit about the man, William Edison Wiggins. Um, why is he so important? Uh, why was he eclipsed? Uh, why is he significant today? He was talented in so many different ways. He could reproduce 18th century French engraving style perfectly. He could do modern design. He could do all these different things, but he loved ornament and decoration. And I think um, there was a symposium at Harvard in 1949 where they put Merle Armitage and Paul Rand and Dwiggins and Rollins and some other people onto the stage to talk about modernism and so forth. And I think Dwiggins, uh, at that point, he was getting on in years, and he was eclipsed because this wave of beautiful, clear, dynamic, modern design came in, not just from Switzerland, but one thinks of Switzerland as, as one of the um, focal points of it. And so he, um, he had Catholic tastes. He had so many different interests and was very interested in the way things worked mechanically that he spread himself out over this whole area. He's famous in the puppet world, but the the puppet people don't realize he did anything else. They think that's all he did was make puppets. And it's a revelation to them when they realize he made typefaces and wrote and so forth. So 
I think he, in a way, he spread himself out. And what what drew me to wanting to write this book is the inspiring whole person who was so joyful and so delicious, manifested in all these different facets. And it's hard to describe to the outside world that person if there isn't a single facet that's really promoted. And that's what does come out in the work, the joy, except for that last image you showed. And it came out with Dorothy Abbey. She, when she talked about him, she lit up. Um, there, in terms of the archive, where does he fit in the hierarchy of designers and typographers? And well, I mean, we, the, the archive collection now has about 40,000 objects, and the Bluegans collection is several thousand. So it's a, it's a small, um, relatively small, but it's, it's, it's um, very close to my heart because it was something that I focused on as a collector for many years. And um, I think it, it, uh, it's all the, I mean, it's the reasons that we call them all the Bruegans, right? It's the humor, it's the, the, the absolute originality of the ornament and the, the, the modular system he developed for doing it, the beautiful typefaces. Um, and, you know, he, he, his early work is, is pretty classical, and he came up through an era when uh, that was what was, I guess, in some sense, required of him. He did a lot of work for Updike and pretty traditional printers. And he did arts and crafts. He did arts and crafts. He met William Morris, or he was introduced to the work of William Morris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, and he came up, he was, he was um, a student of Gaudi in Chicago. So he came from that heritage, but then as he moved, <coughs> and, and you can see it through the book, you know, the first few chapters, um, some of that work maybe isn't like, those of us who are Williams aficionados can tell it's him, but it's not maybe quite so obvious. By, by the middle of the book and through the rest of it, it's just instantly obvious, right? There's, a, there's something about his work. It's a joy, the use of color, the, the use of ornament. And it's modern in its own way. I think it's, I mean, it's weird because ornament was falling out of fashion by that time. And I think that's a big part of uh, the issue that, or, you know, the reason that he wasn't appreciated as much in the last half of the 20th century. But it's interesting, in the early 21st century, there was a big revival of interest in Wiggins in the type design world because of his influence there and some of his pretty unique theories. Well, Metro is a pretty modern looking place. Yeah. yeah. It was one of the first great American sans heroes. Um, and so it, the, the interest has kind of carried forward and gone in waves. It's sort of legendary. I mean, how many people here knew of Dwiggins before they knew of this book, for example? OK, how did you find out? Like, you know, it's, it's kind of like a word of mouth thing. From, from the ITC show to the, to the people who encounter him at the Boston Public Library, it's kind of a, it's like a weird little cult. Well, one of the things, and we might as well get it on the table, is he's been credited, even in a, an essay I read today by Hilton Alls, with having coined the word graphic design. And Paul Shaw, in his recent blog, showed it was used a year before. Do you think that there's any importance to that claim that he was the graphic design inventor? <laughs> okay, I'll take that. Um, I don't think it really matters. I think that, that um, you know, he, he established, he helped to establish the profession of graphic design by example. And whether that appearance of the term graphic design in 1922 was the first Use. I don't think that's really so material, I and mean, it's not it's not essential to defining or understanding him. Um, but it is true that he came up in a period when uh, you know it was called commercial art, and it was um, you know in the late 19th century there was no independent profession of that sort. Uh, the design, graphic design, and and design for printing was basically accomplished in the printers by uh, you know, 
ranging from compositors to, to people that were more um, really what we would think of as graphic designers, but it certainly wasn't the profession. And also the mix of disciplines where uh, calligraphy, lettering, type design, book design, illustration, he spanned all of those. Not, not all graphic designers do, but that span kind of defines the world of graphic so, um, and his book, uh, Design and Layout, came out the same year as Chico's Noya Topography. Yeah. I want to put in a plug for his writing, too, because we're talking about him using the term graphic design. I think he has a vigorous, muscular, vivid, just beautiful way of expressing himself. And he's a deep thinker about these things. He says the reason that you should use line art when you're printing with letterpress is that uh, you have to, you have to, if you use half tones, which will be coming all the rage, everybody want to be able to use tone, but the paper doesn't show through, it doesn't become a part of the conversation, everything is washed out. And the crisp edges of line art or stencil art match the crisp edges of the letters as they are being printed in type. And so there's a way, in the, in the back of the book, there are 20 pages of his writings about um, the structure of the book, about his mother was a really talented musician, and he loved music. His favorite composer was Satie, no surprise there. And he talks about the relationship between printer's ornament and music. So he's thinking all the time about this stuff. He's not just laying stuff out visually, He's thinking, why am I doing this? What's the reason for this? And usually when he's talked about, there's a limited amount of real estate, some of his visual designs get reproduced. And what's great about our being able to make a book this size is that we were able to reproduce all of these things that he wrote so that people can read his language, which I think is one of his, his strongest suits. Some of that ornament has a kind of rococo or classical sensibility, neoclassical sensibility. And some of it is just so undefinable. That you, you can call it Art Deco, you can call it modern, you can call it modern. Where did that sense of decorativeness come from? You can see it early on when he's still in art school, he's beginning to play with that stuff. Uh, Carl Rollins referred to it as his concrete mixer style at one point. And he was in the um, Park Street subway station seeing these shadows of maybe some street gratings or something. And I think he was just drawn to that pattern. And he kept experimenting with it. In the early days, he made wooden stamps. And then he had this, this he sort of experienced the rapture with, with celluloid because he made his own knives. And the thing with celluloid is you can flip the shape over and you can see exactly where you're positioning it whereas cutting the stamps in wood was much less precise. And so it, in a way, filled the need that he had to uh, celebrate that kind of pattern. And the stencils that he worked on. Stencil has always been this kind of old-fashioned, working, functional tool, but also a symbol of modern machine age sensibility. His falls somewhere in between. How would you talk about it? Well, I think that's right. I mean, one thing Bruce touched on the idea that, that the, his ornament um, marries so well with type because it's kind of the same sensibility. And in fact, he cut stencils of uh, you know elements, basically uh, the, the core elements of letter form, from which he made up alphabets and experimented with typefaces and letter design. And then in, the, in that same medium, you would, would switch over and cut geometric shapes as elements or, or organic shapes as elements and build them up into ornament. And so you can see this kind of um, perfect marriage between the, the ornament and the type. I also think it's worth noting that he really, he had deep historical knowledge and amazing skill. I mean, there's a, there's a piece of calligraphy in the book in 1905 that's better than anything Johnson was doing. It just blows his mind, and it wasn't known. But he also really thought of himself as uh, a 20th century uh, designer. 
And, and, and particularly when he was talking about type design, but also in some of his other commentary, he's definitely looking for a modern um, expression. But he's not looking for the modern expression that came out of Europe. Or like, I mean, he yes. got sent to Europe. He got a, a free trip. Right. But there was something that was very New England about him. Yeah. Why didn't he step over the line? <laughs> You're the New Englander still. <laughs> well, if you look at his romping through mathematics book cover, the red and black mm -hmm. cover, he's kind of edging in that direction, but even though shapes are not the same, there's a, a way that he wanted to stay felicitous and warmer, in a way maybe some, some residue from the arts and crafts stuff, where he's still he wants to be clearer about what he's doing, but he doesn't want to go that far. And so he stays in this kind of gray area that can't really be defined. That's the problem with Dwiggins, is that you can't, you can't put him in a pigeonhole. There's a double spread you have in the book, the magazine covers, essay, and what's the measure? measure, measure. measure. Yeah. And I remember talking about Dwiggins with Paul Rand, and Rand would just say, ah, he's an old, old fart. <laughs> um, and then we had lunch. Um, but those covers belie any sense of old fartiness. Um, say more about what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> he, he used colors in colors and shapes in jarring ways that you don't expect to see, and yet they, they clunk in exactly the right way. So he's experimenting, and if you look at that two-page spread, you see the range of his ideas for this one client. He's doing two different magazines, one essay and one measure. And um, it's one project, though, right? Okay. And those were sketches, comps, right? Those are, those are comps. I, I think it's not just the, the, the contemporary feeling of them that's so amazing, but also the just extraordinary variety. So this is it. This, is, this was for one magazine publisher who hadn't decided yet whether to call it essay or measure. So this is basically the whole spread is comps for one thing. And that's the range of his expression as a mature artist. I think it's it's kind of emblematic. It kind of looks like what's on the wall. Well, you know, it's very, but I mean, could you mistake this for anyone else? Like, every one of those, even though there's this enormous stylistic range in the comps, is is distinctively brilliant. The color, the, the composition, the, the, you know, delicious treatment of the letter form. Um, so, by the time he was a mature artist, he still had, he was involved in a lot of different things, and he um, uh, therefore had a kind of a stylistic range, so it's hard, like, he's, he's not so easy to pigeonhole. But at the same time, that mature work, is, it's absolutely unique, it's distinctly, it's a little mistake. So Bruce, you were talking about his writing, and I would argue that he was one of the first design critics. Uh, the way we think of it, as analyzing and opinionating. Um, did he have a philosophy? Well, here, here's a quote that uh, I'm, I'm going to have to paraphrase this. I don't remember exactly. Somebody in the Boston newspaper wrote a, a famous painter, wrote a critique of a show of children's art. And Dwiggins did a repost and said, what this person doesn't get is that the children's art has something called voltage. <laughs> and I think there's a way that he wanted to find this essential energy of what it means to be alive in all of these different aspects. And he channeled that, this, this delicious sense of satire and humor that you can accomplish goals, if you want to effect change, it's better to do it through humor than it is to scold. 
and wag your finger. You, you use the term repost. We're not talking about wet. No. <laughs> um, he did a lot of commercial work. And you show and talk about the commercial work he did when he was in Boston, before he came to Boston, but mostly while he was in Boston before going to Fenway Street Studio. Um, what was his relationship to commerce? He, like so many of the others, and there are, uh, there are other practitioners at the Archive, commercial here, the Archive is an incredible place. If you get to San Francisco, you have to go there. <coughs> he was a commercial artist who was doing the bidding of these people and wanting to do it. They, they needed him to do it quickly. And so he, he cranked out all this hand lettering, all these drawings for furniture ads for the newspaper and so on. I think what the paper companies in particular appreciated about Dwiggins was that he had a sense of imagination and loved education, loved working with S.D. Warren, teaching printers how to make what was produced on Warren paper look better, which made the Warren paper look better. And so he, um, he came up through that wanting to do typeface design and book design, but spent decades doing this other commercial work. And it was the perfect um, practice for him to hand letter all this stuff and then later become a type designer. Well, I've often thought of him doing this commercial work. Some of it is uh, remarkable, like the paper samples we're talking about. Some of it just seems to fit the tone of the day. What was he like with clients? Was he like the rest of us? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know that there's that much documentation about what he was like with clients. They typically came to him. He was pretty much moored to the house because of his diabetes. He did spend all those years at the studio, and people would gather around. So there were, there were little um, clots of friends who were getting together over tea and talking. Just let me interrupt for a second. He had diabetes before there was insulin. They figured he'd die around 40 years old like his father, but he lived to 70-something. 76, yep. The Canadians discovered insulin the same year that he was diagnosed when he was 42 with uh, uh, brittle, very severe diabetes. And so we got 30 years of work out of him that, that we wouldn't have had if they hadn't discovered insulin. Well, one of the things that that did, I think he got serious about what he really wanted to do and shifted his career away from advertising and commercial design, even though he'd written text on it, to focus on book design, then type design, and marionettes with the hobby. Yeah. Um, and that's all afterwards. And there's a, another piece in the writing section in the back of the book where he's chomping on the hand that feeds him. He's saying, even though advertising was his main source of revenue in the years when he was uh, in, the, in the teens and early 20s, He's saying advertising is now manipulating people to buy stuff that they don't need. In the old days, advertising was informational. What's wrong with that? So Now, you, you point out in the book that he kept a journal until he moved to Fenway, I believe? Yeah, through the 20s, into the 20s, he kept a journal, and then it just stops in 1927. So what was he like, in, well, what did you find he was like in terms of his business activity? I mean, he and his wife Mabel bought a house that was within their means. He ultimately expanded on the house. He ultimately built a studio across the street. Um, was he able to make a good living, uh, an extensive living? Uh, in the early years, it was a struggle. In their 20s, they followed Gowdy. Bertha and Fred Gowdy said, come on, it's a friendly town. Move to Hingham. So they, they had just gotten married. They went back to Williams' hometown of Cambridge, Ohio. They went there, and then Gowdy said, oh, we can't work here. We're leaving. And so the Dwigginses stayed put, and they, they had a very hand-to-mouth existence in those years of their 20s. After that, he was starting to make a pretty handsome living. And when you look at some of his income statements, you can see he was not uh, a millionaire by any means, but he could live comfortably enough. They didn't have kids that they could afford to put two additions on the house. They didn't have a car. He said he put his money, instead of owning an automobile, he would put his money into printing things that he liked to make and distribute around to people. So I think they, 
They lived well and frugally. They had Middle Western, small town attitudes about how you live your life. And they had a circle of friends that they enjoyed. They, the the uh, marionette productions grew out of a writer's group that they had all formed together. So I think they, in Hingham, had a, quite a comfortable life. So did he build the studio to have a studio or to have a marionette stage? Yes. It's downstairs and it's <laughs> a marionette stage. It was two, two levels. It was two levels. And um, there's a huge clear story, north facing clear story window upstairs for the design studio. And he wanted live music for the marionette productions in the garage, the first marionette theater, which was called 0.5 Irving Street, 0 0.5 Irving Street, right behind the house. There wasn't enough room uh, for live music. And he had his mother's reed organ, plus there was an upright piano. Uh, several of the marionette troupe members uh, played clarinet and so forth. So they wanted to have live music. And one of the reasons that he built the studio in 1937 was so that they could seat 70 people and have enough room for live music. Mm -hmm. Tragically, World War II came along, people, there was attrition, uh, and it didn't ever turn into the kind of splendiferous uh, set of productions that, that he wanted. But the building was clearly an expression of those two parallel tracks. Which leads me to this quick question. I know the house that he lived in on Levitt Street was sold when Dorothy Abbey was alive. What happened to the studio where all these hand-painted lighting fixtures and the stage and everything else? It should, it should have been put on the Historical. National Register or whatever it's called, but it was bought by people who cantilevered an addition on stilts out behind the, the house, behind the studio. And those of us who went there and saw the hand-carved latches, all of these Every detail in the place was something that he did himself. He was his eighth birthday present was a, a eight foot long plank of clear pine, a one by twelve plank of clear pine, as he loved to play. And so the marionettes were like this lightning bolt where he loved theater and he loved carving wood. What's not to like about marionettes? But the whole place was filled with his um, character. And if somehow it could have been rescued and turned into um, something you, preserved. Do you think they threw great. out the, the lampshades and what else? You know, I think it's, I, I, you were talking about the early days and, and uh, he actually, I mean, I want to emphasize, he actually made it very good income. Like if you take his, his peak career income and roll it forward into current dollars, he was one of the best paid graphic designers of the age, for sure, if not. Near and through book work and type through work. book work and you know the book work is another interesting thing. After the diabetes, he almost never traveled, and it was after that that he began to work for Knopf. You know, he designed I think over 300 trade books, all by post. So the client relations are in the correspondence, <coughs> but this idea that I mean he was the first FedEx artist, right? He was he he basically was parked in the country designing books and illustrations and working with clients all over the country mm -hmm. uh, through the U.S. Mail. Um, the other thing is that in the early 20th century, and this is what gets lost because in the latter 20th century he was not well known, and we're in the, you know, now we're like rediscovering him in a sense, but in the early 20th century he was the most famous, um, I'm going to say graphic designer, whatever you want to call him, of, of that time. There were lots of things written about him. Uh, he was one of the early AOG medalists, so he was he was pretty well known. Uh, he never sought fame, and he didn't really like he didn't even go to to receive awards and stuff. I've never seen him in a suit or tie. He wore a tie for when he got the uh, the honorary degree from Harvard. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about his circle. Who did he hang with? <laughs> well, his his two really close friends. <coughs> lifelong friends were Rudolf Rizika and Carl Perrington Rollins. So those were professional connections. He was good buddies with George Macy, uh, with Paul Bennett, uh, more I would say Paul Bennett than Chauncey Griffith at Linotype. So he definitely had friends in his professional life, but he also had friends in this private circle, people in the, in the Hingham area that he hung out with, and he spent a lot of time by himself. Mabel didn't tend to come into the studio. One of the great things about 
Dorothy's arrival, I don't know about you guys, but I, for a long time, labored under the impression that Dorothy had worked with Wiggins for a really long time. And then I realized, no, it was only 10 years. And uh, she energized him when he was beginning to go downhill between 66 and 76. Mabel never went into the studio, but they had a whole life outside of what was going on in the studio. He was friendly and worked with Bruce Rogers, but that one sour. What happened? Well, they spent a lot of time when Wiggins first got to Boston. Rogers was was based there in Boston and had had this connection with Houghton Mifflin, and they liked each other, enjoyed each other. But Rogers went. Here's what I would say: Rogers would do something beautiful and impeccable, wouldn't care what it cost. He would just say, here, make this. Dwiggins, meanwhile, is writing a Knopf and saying, well, you know, if we use ink to, the, the ink is all kind of soupy and vague, let's not use ink to stamp these cases. And besides, if we do it this way, we can save five cents a copy. And the way he was looking at that was, I'm a proletarian at heart. Yes, I'm doing this work for Random House and Limited Editions Club, but I want to deliver a $2.50 novel to the average person that's going to buy a Knopf title. I don't want it to cost $275 or $3. And if I can help Alfred figure out how to keep it at $250, that's great. And so there's a way that he was looking at manufacturing and the whole process of making the books, rather than stating imperially, well, here's my design, make it happen, and I don't, I don't care how much it costs. Anybody in the audience want to ask? Gentlemen, a question. There's a hand back there. Okay. Um, I'm just curious. You listed a couple things that you think might have contributed to Dwiggins' obscurity, like changing taste and the Bauhaus style, I'm guessing. I'm just curious if he felt like any of that was a threat to him or if he was against any of that uh, during his lifetime, or if he felt like he was part of that movement, that change in taste. He certainly was not a fan of Merle Armitage. <laughs> Um, Merle was doing these very big, splashy, two-page spread, title pages and so on. So he, he felt, if you look at the transcripts of this 1949 symposium, what he's saying is, remember the reader. And what he's criticizing about modernism is that people are using a grid and they're saying, we're going to adhere to this grid no matter what. And in fact, that may not make it as friendly for the reader as it would be if you thought of it in a different way. So I think he was confident in what he was doing. He was a little um, surprised that modernism was, was <coughs> taking off in the way that it was, but I don't think he felt um, bitter about it in any way. It was just a difference, difference in, in what people were looking for, and he was happy to continue to provide for anybody who wanted to dance with him the things that he could offer. There's a, a, a well-reproduced collection of Knopf logos. A number of them are Dwiggins. Uh, there's one by Ed Korn, the cartoonist, and there's one by Paul Rand with just a couple of lines in the dot. Uh, did Dwiggins lose any work at, as the mid-century modernists started waving cresting in the 40s, 50s? I don't, I, the timing wasn't right for that. You know, he was already near the end of his career at the time of the century lines and was taking hold. So I don't think there was a lot of direct competition. He had long standing relationships with clients that kept him busy. And, and um, so I, I don't know that it was direct, it's more in terms of indirect and environmental shift. A question about Mabel. You said she never went into the studio that they did share a life together. And your book actually suggests much more of a life than I expected. Uh, what did they have in common? What did they do together? They loved going for walks. They uh, loved writing, both of them. And in fact, may I take 60 seconds to read something from Mabel? They have no choice. <laughs> They moved into this house when they when they first got to Hingham, they found a house and they rented it for, for quite a few years. So 
this is Mabel writing. Six windows, oh, I should show you, here's the house. Six windows looked out over the meadow with its meandering brook and a low, dark line of trees beyond. The brook was full of forget-me-nots, and the little willow bridge had rails where one could lean over and watch the flowers undulating in the water. The meadow was carefully tended by the gentleman farmer who lived in the big house at the end of the road. I used to wonder how much he would charge for the view if he knew how we enjoyed it. In the spring, the brook would overflow its banks so that patches of blue sky lay about on the ground. And on certain summer evenings, a low white fog would cover the entire meadow like a lake, coming right up to the terrace on which our house stood. So I think they were very happy together. And <laughs> I don't know if prurient is the right word, gossipy, this, oh, I wonder if Dorothy and Dwiggins got it on. And I think that Dwiggins and Dorothy had a fabulous artistic affair for the whole time that they were working together. They absolutely adored each other. That wasn't a threat to Mabel. And in fact, after Dwiggins died, Dorothy, she moved into the house in 1946, realizing Mabel had bad asthma, dementia, Dwiggins had diabetes, they needed help. So she drove them around in the car, took Mabel shopping, did the cooking, did the house cleaning, and after Dwiggins died, she took care of Mabel for another 10 years. And so there was a devotion to the whole family that she had, not just to Dwiggins. And so I feel a lot of impatience around this sort of gossip. And I, there is that. <laughs> there isn't a lot of presence of Mabel in Dwiggins' studio life, but I tried to put it into the book wherever I could. You succeeded. Any mm. other questions? Mm. Yes, sir. Uh, I am always uh, astonished by the fecundity of Dwiggins' work, and, but also its quantity. And do you think, have you been able to circumstantially put together an idea of how quickly he turned around assignments generally. For example, the books he did for Knopf, in which we might have some cars dated correspondence back and forth. That work, I would say, was more reflective. I think the, the advertising and commercial stuff is what's different. He got a phone call one day from Paul Hollister, who was then at bbb and o in New York. Oh, here we are in New York. And um, they, General Motors needed a logotype. And Dwiggins produced the logotype in less than 48 hours. So I think that work of that nature, he turned around very quickly. But he didn't give it to them for a year. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Rand used to say, I do it in 20 minutes, but then I refine it for six months. <laughs> so I think his... Um, his book work tended to be more reflective. He was always complaining to Crosby Gage, the person whom I showed three books. He, he did more than three books for Gage, and he complained that Gage wasn't giving him enough time. So I think in the book work and in the types, he wanted to stretch it out. And you look in the chapter on type designs, Falcon is, is in development for a number of years and keeps going through these phases where, OK, this one gets the guillotine pick it up again and do it again. So I think he was able to crank out something quickly, but he preferred to chew on things a little longer if he could. Did it set answer? Yeah, yeah. And, and he was, I mean, there's, it, it, it was incredibly prolific. I, I can tell you that uh, the book has 1,200 illustrations in it, but we had close to 8,000 captures to choose from. Mm. And that was some, one of the first things I think both of us have ever, we sat together uh, for several weeks, looking at spreads, looking at possibilities, and looking at, you know, basically reviewing all the images and, and getting it down to the full point. I, don't, I mean, there's so much good stuff left out. Uh, but there's room for... Well, we're going to put something on the web. We're, we're in the process of digitizing the rest of the, the archive collection, and it's going up in the web. And uh, the BPL... Well, the stuff that we shot there, I mean, those 8,000 captures, at some point, they'll probably all get tuned up and put on the lab. We, we, we had a deal with the BPL where, where um, 
they allowed us to bring our own rig in uh, as long as we share the captures with them. How many here have been to the BPL to see the drip and smoke? Not as many as I expect. Can you just describe the Jurgens three rooms for a minute? Well, one of them is um, kind of a recreation of the studio. It has its desk, it has some of those working tools and files, it has um, the, the, uh, some of the furniture you built and the book rug that you designed to help, that sort of stuff. The others are, are Mary and I related. So there's the, the proscenium and the in glass display cases in the past. And unfortunately, the BPL is closed until probably 2019 at the earliest is when they'll reopen because they, the Philip Johnson building, the so-called new building from 1972, had all kinds of problems with the HVAC system. So that's all off limits until maybe 2020. But it's a fabulous trip to make to go and see those three rooms and the, the one that Rob mentioned first, that's sort of the pseudo-office, there's a whole shelf of all of his books, and you can see the mural that he painted for the dining room of Sinbad's home port before Sinbad would go out on these voyages. This is the other thing about Wiggins. He had this very active fantasy life where he wrote all these stories. You don't know if they're taking place now or thousand years ago or in the future and where are they? Well, maybe vaguely in the Middle East or something. He um, was a really good science fiction writer. Question. Who was, uh, who was he inspired by or influenced by or what was he looking at? He loved the Persians and the Chinese. Mm -hmm. For color, especially. Mm -hmm. But we also think one um, And you know, I think Gaudi was a big influence, and, and his time in Chicago at the Frank Holmes School, which was where Gaudi and, and uh, you know, he, the, Oz Cooper was there, and, and so there was that connection and that sort of pedagogy in, in letter form and illustration, and that was a big influence at the beginning of his career. Um, you know, it's funny because you said some of the ornament looks a little bit like deco, and, and I think it does, but it's so unique. It's kind of, I don't think he really was copying. Right. By, by the time he got to make career and his, his mature work that's really very much his own, um, he's certainly not copying. He's, he's, he's at that point, I think, synthesizing just his vast knowledge of, of history and aesthetics generally. And he was, he was aware of what was going on in the current world. He didn't like all of it, but he certainly was aware of it. I remember in the studio there was a bookcase full of his books. But I never, never saw the book that he read. What was he reading? Science fiction, history, love music, spent a lot of time listening to music. Dorothy, among other things, had a fast Buick. Dorothy came from a very comfortable background. So she always had a brand new fast Buick convertible. And um, she had a really good record player. And so they would go out and about, they would drive around and then come back and, and listen to music. And he loved A.A. A. Milne, and he, mm -hmm. I, he mostly read science fiction and history were his two biggest interests. Another question? Yes. Uh, in terms of time design, how important do you think the relationship with C.H. Griffith was? Extremely important, and I would say they were like Fred and Ginger. although. Wiggins came up with these shapes, Griffith was a very good sparring partner and critic and did a lot of the spacing of the letters. And a lot of his notes are on the galleys. So I think there's a very wonderful and splendid uh, relationship between the two. And of course, Griffith was, was also a type designer, even though he was in charge of that department too. So he, he was a, a good critic for Dwiggins and Sometimes Wiggins wanted to work on newspaper faces and Griffiths was saying, down boy, that's, that's my department, I'll take care of that. And then he came back later and, and did work on one. So to end with, let's talk about his type design, since now everybody's designing typefaces. Um, what was his favorite face? What was his least favorite face? Of his own? Of his or, own. I don't know, it's hard to say. 
Yeah. I, he liked them all, I would say. Mm -hmm. And he started out loving Scotch Roman and Caslon. Um, he, he did a piece, which is there's a, in, in the book, you can read his notes about the different, he's not too fond of one of Gaudi's types, <coughs> even though Gaudi was his great friend and teacher. But I guess I would, if you were forced to pick one, I would say Electra is the one that maybe he was the, the most fond of. I, I don't know whether there's other, I mean, it's certainly it's the one I'm most fond of. And I, and I think that his, not only the, the structure of it and the aesthetic of it, but also the way that he thought about it. Um, I'm tempted to read the, the little bit of the electric, which is so amazing. Um, uh, we also did a new cut of electric for the book, um, for those of you who don't um, know that. Um, who made that? Jim Parkinson. Um, Going to, to the, do you want to go to the couple of days? Oh, yeah, 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 of course, in the writings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> uh, okay, so this is, it's a longer piece. I'm just going to excerpt it a little bit. This is, this is something that he wrote, um, uh, and, and he did this in, in most of his specimens, but th this was in the linotype uh, uh, first release specimen for Electra. And, um, it's in the form, it says, the, the header is comment by W.A.D. on a new linotype face, but it's in the form of a dialogue with Kobadaishi, who was a, a, a great uh, Japanese scribe and patron, patron saint of the lettering art. Um, let's see, okay. Um, so, Kobodaishi said, the trouble with all you people is that you're always trying to reproduce Jensen's letters, or John Despira, or some of those Venetian people. You're always going back three or four hundred years and trying to do over what they did then. What's the idea? Well, I said, we think those types were pretty good, about the best that anybody ever made, and we'd like to make some like them. But why like them, he said. You don't live in Venice in 1500. This is 1935. Why don't you do what they did? Take letter shapes and see if you can't work them into something that stands for 1935. Why doll yourself up in Venetian fancy dress costume and go dodging around in airplanes and automobiles dressed up that way? Um, and didn't say anything. Okay. Electricity, he said. Sparks, energy, high speed steel, metal shavings coming off the lathe, precise, positive. Say it with a snap. Take your curves and streamline them. Make a line of letters so full of energy that it can't wait to get to the end of my measure. My God, those lino machines you tell me about, what kind of letters would they spit out if you left it to them? <laughs> <laughs> so he was very much thinking about, um, you no, know, he, he didn't want to just rehash. And especially by the, the end of his career, you see the whole flow of that passion. And he, would, he endlessly experimented. One last question. Did he ever say in writing why he never chose to give a typeface his own name? That wouldn't be like him. No. no. When the AIGA had a big show in 1937, Mabel went to represent the <laughs> Wigan State Hall. He didn't even come down here to be present at the show, he just stayed home. He wasn't interested in uh, Gaudi and Zopf would see where the spotlight is and then maybe edge over to be <coughs> nearer where it would shine if somebody asked a question. <laughs> Dwiggins would be around the corner. He just wasn't wasn't interested in, in that. So I think for if somebody had said, oh, let's name a typeface Dwiggins, he would have said, we can do better than that. <laughs> Decent people don't name types after themselves. <laughs> Any last word? Oh, oh sure. I was wondering, so for, you know, Dwiggins, who was around 1904 and stuff, what, what are some of your top things that you think maybe could be resonating with people today who are type designers and graphic designers? Like, 
Well, you see this all the time with visitors at the archive. Oh yeah, I mean the the, the young people that we see, we, we have quite a lot of Brigham's, um, some original lettering, not nearly as much as the BPL, but some, and but quite a lot of uh, proofs from linotype, including the experimentals, and they're not really that well known. They haven't been published broadly, at least recently. I mean, a lot of people come in who are discovering them for the first time, and they just they just they're, they're so strong and original. Um, there's, there's a whole, I mean, I could go down the rabbit hole about the Young formula, which is this, this idea that he learned from um, uh, his work in marionettes, um, certain principles of form that he ended up applying to type. And um, that's, that has sort of captured the imagination, but I, I think it's really just about the type. They're very, very good. They set you. If I can, I just want to end it on one quick thing. He was a satirist. And he was a really funny guy. And there's a publication he did called They, with a logo that looks like Dolly did Vogue. <laughs> and it's cut, you call it something. It's, it's bound to skew. The pages are all crooked. But you use a geometric term that I can't remember. Oh, it's, I think it's a trapezoid. Well, the trapezoid. envelope, the envelope and that's an interesting piece, because that was from the late teens. He must have been aware of some of the European stuff that was going on at the time, futurism and, and uh, constructivism and so forth. I just feel like a bit of an echo of that aesthetic, but it's so him, and it's so American. It's really kind of a fun, unique piece. I remember, we, didn't we discover that together? I remember in the DPL. I had never seen it. I'm not sure you'd seen it. This is a moment. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember. I, it just blew me away, that thing. It's amazing. And then, of course, he did the uh, wonderful infographic way ahead of its time. Oh, yeah. Fever line breaking through. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So, do you guys have any last words? Well, I have, I have some housekeeping. Um, if if you don't have a book and you want one, there's a special price on the regulars, and we have stock on the regulars on the table. There are also postcards for sale. Um, the deluxes are, we have a couple of deluxes that aren't yet spoken for, and if you're interested in one, uh, let us know and we can take an order for it. Um, and the other thing that I need to do is, okay, raise your hand if you back the book. Thank you very much. No, no, keep them up. Keep them up. Now take your hand down if you are a TDC member. Okay. The people with their hands still up, come see us. We have something. For you. You're going to be on jury. <laughs> well, the question is, did you pay five bucks? Or did you I pay paid the full freight. You paid the full freight. If you yes, paid the sir. full freight. Before we make an arrangement with Carol, we'll either give you a set of postcards or a $20 bill, your choice. <laughs> and I'd like to read one more thing from Mr. Wood. This is, he's 41. This is from a, a piece that he hand-lettered entirely. There's a, a long narrative poem. And then this is his philosophy of life. Myself, I hope to live in a land that I've made out of potsherds and broken bits. It's not a well-articulated country, and it's not different from a many that other people have made. There are old things in it, but it's not old. I managed to have arched masonry dug out of Rome and Greek fragments of marble, but the colonists from Greece have forgotten their fatherland and passed through their cattle under the columns. <laughs> there are glints from the east in the land if there are really no Easterners there. I use words to furnish this part of the country. Samarkand and Isfahan. They do as much as real colonists would, and much more musically. I do not need real things in this part. I choose, rather, invocations of memories or imaginings. All the claptrap of oriental imagery serves me very well. Dust and sun and faded bright colors. There are no cities, and there are only the more picturesque sorts of merchants. How the inhabitants live, I'm not too much inclined to ask, being over close to the problem myself in this part of the world. But they're mostly countrymen and work in the soil. You will see that the country is hopelessly romantic. 
hopelessly to you, I mean. For a time back, I was ashamed of its nearness to ruined Rome and hid its existence. Now I've grown careless about your opinions and am inclined to live in whatever land I please. <laughs>